I'm John Nichols. I write for The Nation magazine about politics and media issues, and I'm also an editor of the Capital Times newspaper in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm Bob McChesney. I'm a professor at the University of Illinois. I teach and write about media. When I was growing up in Union Grove, Wisconsin, population 1,970, um, we believed that democracy was pretty much what we saw, and that was a small town where everybody knew everybody, and uh, we had our local elections, and uh, we knew all the candidates personally, and they would come out and make their case for themselves. They might disagree a little bit on issues, but basically we were all part of a whole. And, uh, and frankly, it was totally romantic and, and very, very idealistic. And the funny thing is, I don't think I ever let go of that. The, this is the odd, odd reality. As I've grown older, uh, I continue to you know, harken back to that little town and, and to the way that we did things. What it taught me is that people who are very different from one another, economically, socially, and in all sorts of ways, actually can form a, a community and settle their differences in a small d democratic way. The problem is that we have a media in this country that tells us that's impossible. The reality is I've seen it in play in the town I grew up in. When I was growing up, I was given a very romantic and idealistic notion of what democracy was, and I, I very much bought into it and believed it. The idea that America was a country that was a, where everyone was equal, uh, where we weren't an empire, where uh, truth willed out, where we had a media that told us the truth, where the will of the people governed and there wasn't corruption. I genuinely believed that growing up. That was what I was taught. And I remember my mother, who was a product of the Depression, when I would say that to her, she would look at me in disbelief. Like, how could someone possibly believe that? Because she was a, a child of the 20s and 30s. But it was a particular moment in this country, I think in the 1960s, early 60s, uh, where there was a spectacular innocence. And I, I was part of that. And I think part of the new left and part of the experience of growing up in the United States was the conflict of that when you saw the reality of America, the racism, the war, the militarism, that you really felt like someone had stolen something from you, that this great country you thought you lived in really wasn't great. And I think that was the experience I had. I, I think the greatest challenge in America, uh, not today and really not, not even in, in recent times, I, I think in fairness it's probably the last 30 to 40 years, has been a sense that the answers are invariably going to come from above and that there are political players who know better than the people what the solutions for their lives are. And when you set up a system where the power is always sort of pushing down, not coming up from, from the grassroots, uh, money knows where to go. It, it goes and it buys those opinion makers, uh, be it media or politics or commentary, whatever, whatever zone, and it keeps reinforcing a lie. And, and, you know, when I came out of college, I became a labor reporter. And I went to Toledo, Ohio, which is an old labor town. And I remember that the congressman woman from Toledo was a woman named Marcy Kaptur. She's still in Congress. And Marcy used to say to me all the time, you need to learn about these trade issues. You need to learn about free trade and fair trade and things like that, because that's how they're going to come for our jobs. And Marcy used to always say this. She said, ask yourself who's going to make money when this thing plays out, when, when the thing we're told is going to be good for everybody, who's the most likely to make the money? And, and damned if she wasn't right. Uh, Toledo, Ohio has lost just about all of its major factories. Uh, it's been a town that's been devastated by free trade policies that have not made anybody in some country overseas richer, uh, and they haven't made anybody in Toledo richer, but they've made multinational corporations uh, headquartered, sometimes in the U.S., sometimes abroad, always trading on Wall Street, and always winning the fight because they control the narrative. And that's the, that's the critical thing to understand. And it keeps coming back to us, fight after fight, situation after situation. If democracy is defined, if our kind of parameters for our democratic discourse are defined in Washington or on Wall Street, the winners will always be the people who make the most money off the result that they're promoting. The corporate media have a track record of covering corporate behavior that's uh, deplorable. It's the darkest chapter of our news media's coverage of business. You know, we look at the history, just the recent history, and what do we see in corporate news media? 
Well, in the middle of the 20th century, there were hundreds and hundreds of full-time labor reporters and editors on major daily newspapers and small daily newspapers uh, and on our broadcast media. It wasn't uncommon at all if there were a strike or a major election in a union, front page story, major coverage. Growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, just by listening to the AM news on a rock station and just by looking at the headlines on the front page on my way to the sports section, I could name the leaders of probably seven or eight major labor federations. They were well known. If there were strikes, they were covered. It was a big story. Uh, by the 1990s, labor coverage was pretty much eliminated in American news media. It just stopped being a story. Instead, what we saw was this huge increase of business coverage. Now that in itself doesn't necessarily mean that corporations are getting good coverage. The problem was it was almost all public relations coverage. It was at best coverage for investors, how they could make the most money. But generally it wasn't even very good at that. And Citizens United unfortunately puts us in a much worse position because now what's going to happen as a result of Citizens United is that the news media, which citizens, Americans, people depend upon to monitor corporate power, uh, the press is simply that much more overmatched. What remains of the press? It was doing a terrible job in the first place, and now it's, it's, it, the degree of difficulty has increased exponentially as corporate money comes into elections, as it dominates elections, as actual news coverage of elections continues to decrease. Uh, we're entering what can only be called really a propaganda state. Look, regular people have to get involved with this issue as a life and death issue for their democracy. To my mind, the Necessary Act is an amendment to the Constitution of the United States that says that people, citizens, have a right to genuine speech and a speech that is not shouted down by corporations and by powers beyond them. And those amendments, whatever form it takes, must maintain a, a, a real free society, a society where everybody has a right to speech, but no one has a right to a speech that shouts down other citizens. Mm -hmm.